Welcome, welcome, welcome to Building the Black Educator Pipeline podcast. I am your host, Shana Terrell, educated activist dedicated to the lifelong struggle of freedom and liberation for my people. Today, we will be discussing the impact of African-centered education and high quality student outcomes. I would love for you all to please welcome my guest to the show, Mama Deborah Watkins. Welcome, Mama. Thank you, Shana. It is an honor to be here today. Yes, it is our honor and our pleasure, Mama, to have you on. Super excited to hear about you and the work that you guys are doing. So what we love to start off with is um, we want our guests to get to know you a little bit. So can you share a little bit about yourself? Um, Share with us who you are. Uh, What should we know about your work? past and present. Okay. Well, let me begin at the beginning. <laughs> I say, we know you've been in the game for a minute, mama. So tell us, I, tell us. Yes, that's, <laughs> you're, be, you're being kind. I have been in the work for, <laughs> I've been in the work, I'm going to say for 50 years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be celebrating my 69th birthday at the end of this uh, month on July 25th. And I'm just yes. happy um, that God has given me the wherewithal to continue in this education for liberation work for, um, you know, 50 years. And I started when I was in high school and helped start the first black student union at my predominantly white high school in Pomona, California. And then I went on to live in France for a year as an exchange student right after high school. Yes, I, je parle français toujours. Hey! Uh, And (laughs) um, have stayed in touch with my French family for 50 years and I have visited with them. I'm excited to be a a world traveler. Traveling does uh, open up horizons for everybody. Went to undergraduate school at Pitzer, uh, the Claremont Colleges, went to Stanford for graduate school in 1977. I started teaching in the largest high school district in Northern California, the East Side Union High School District. And from there, I was fortunate enough, Shana, to uh, begin teaching in an environment where Black educators had already organized themselves to support newbies like me. So from the beginning, I was supported by the Black educators of East Side, and the Black educators of East Side, five years later, joined with the Black educators of Allen Rock School. So Bees and Bears became the Santa Clara County Alliance of Black Educators in the midst, in in the heart of Silicon Valley, California. And after um, I was a founding member of the Santa Clara County Alliance of Black Educators, we call it the Alliance for short. Then um, I became president from in 1994 and until 2001. And then I helped start a statewide organization called the California Alliance of African-American Educators in 2001. And um, nine years ago, I started incubating a national organization under the California Alliance of African-American Educators. And that national organization was launched officially seven years ago as a Black Education Network. So that's the long story short. Listen, all of this work, all of this organizing and people collaborating and just hard work and liberation work that you have been doing in the game for 50 years. And anybody listening um, or watching, y'all know mama don't look like she on her 69th birthday. (laughs) So let me just say that. I'm glad that the movement has been keeping you young. Uh, Definitely young um, in spirit as an elder. I think this is beautiful. So all of this work um, and this beautiful journey that you've been on, can you talk to us about like what inspired you to actually get into education and become an educator? That's a great question, Shana. When I was in fourth grade, red hair, roly poly, Mr. Stevenson, freckle face, Mr. Stevenson said I was the best writer in his class. I should become an English teacher. So I decided I'm going to become an English teacher. And that's what I did. That's amazing. And again, your story, like so many of our other guests that comes on here, somebody tapped you on the shoulder 
and told you what they saw in you and you pursued that dream. So many of our young people, especially at the tender age of like in fourth grade, we're like nine or 10. have no dream. Like, I mean, you have dreams of like what you want to be, uh, but you don't have a focused goal. But when somebody tells you you're going to be something or you can be something, most kids take that to heart and start to work at it. So shout out to uh, Mr. Stevenson for telling you that you could be an educator and a teacher because definitely this is the, the place and the space that you need to be. I will. Sure I do need to say this too. Mm-hmm. So I grew up in Pomona, and Pomona was ninety five percent white in nineteen sixty when I was seven years old, and mm-hmm. we moved there. And all of my teachers from K to twelve were white, and the Eurocentric frame worked for me, but because I love school. But those same white teachers terrorized my black brother, and from kindergarten to tenth grade. And in 10th grade, one of the white teachers called him the N word and he threw a desk at the teacher and he was expelled from the school district. Of course, nothing happened to the teacher, Um, but my brother was expelled uh, from um, that school district and his life spiraled into something that wasn't good. And in my book entitled Thoughts Held Hostage, A Black Teacher's Journey of Unlocking Young Young Minds, I mentioned how my brother was murdered at age 24. And Mm -hmm. I realize now that had he had my brother had a teacher who recognized his genius in kindergarten instead of, you know, sitting him to the, to the principal's office all the time, not because he was bad. My brother was spoiled. My mother had six girls and then she had a son. And we just doted on that little boy. And so when that little boy went to kindergarten, nobody was telling him what to do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And tragically, um, nobody saw my brother's genius um, in kindergarten. And so from K to 10, he was on what I now have the words for. And that is the school to prison pipeline. And my mother was a, she was a prison warden. She worked as a correctional officer at the Chino Institution for Women. So she did not play that. We were always on the other side of the law, but um, tragically, because the system is so racist and is so arrayed against black children um, in general, not all black children, because, you know, I made it through it, but the vast majority of our children do not succeed in this systemically racist system. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, my brother was one of those casualties. Mama Deborah, my condolences, um, but we thank you for sharing that story. And your brother's story is reflective of so many stories of young black people who are on that road to the school to prison pipeline. And I think what you point out is major because it points out the impact that teachers have in children's lives and the impact that schools and teachers have in either putting children on the path to the school to prison pipeline or the school to career pipeline. Like it just you have the power to really change a child's life. Um, What I love that you pointed out too was the fact that your mother, um, who she was and being a constant, um, being a disciplinarian and knowing, right, the other side of those tracks because lots of times, you know, people's automatic thought was like, well, where was the parent? Um, The saying, it truly takes a village to raise a child is a true saying, meaning your mom could be pumping all the love and and all the structure and all the morals um, in to your brother at home but if he gets to school a place where he spends eight hours <laughs> of his day so besides with his family that's where he spends the second most you know of his time um he's treated like a criminal he's treated like a prisoner or he's treated like some type of animal the effect that that has on his mental his psyche and who he believes himself to be um is is so important so i really appreciate you you sharing that story with us but you also point out something that I don't think people talk about a lot um, in education is who you presented to be in school. You were a young woman who loved school, right? Mm-hmm. So to those white teachers, you scream, oh, she's compliant. Um, yes. Right? Oh, she's quiet. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to dote on her. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes if you, you're too loud, you're too strong, you're too resistant, you get pushed into those categories that, that your brother were pushed in, was pushed in. And I think that those, those are super important stories um, to point out in in how we treat um, our children today. So thank you for sharing that. 
Really yeah, and you know, I, I never talked about my brother's um, death, um, his murder. I never talked about it until Trayvon Martin, publicly, until mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin was murdered. And I wrote in, at the time, we were, we called California Alliance of African American Educators, CAAAE for short. And I wrote about it in my present, in my, you know, ED column. And people were like shocked because mm -hmm. they don't, you know, they, they don't see me as the typical, you know, sort of quote unquote crime victim. I mean, victim of somebody, somebody who would have, they don't see me as somebody who would have. Who have a brother that got murdered. Who, who have a brother who got murdered. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, because, you know, I went to Stanford and I, you know, I started this institution and that institution. And, you know, I, I forgot to mention that I also started a STEM program. Um, the first one was in 1998, um, Science, Technology, Engineering and Math. And it was named after Dr. George Washington Carver. And all of my work is unapologetically focused on black children, even though I taught in predominantly white schools for the first or early part of my career. And I loved all my students, but I always had a special place in my heart from for the black ones, you know, and people used to say, Deborah, was it your brother's murder that motivated you to be so passionate about um about black people. And Dr. Renoko Rashidi used to say to me, um, when did you start loving African people? And I said, I was born like this. Yes. I said, I've always loved African people. And I said, and I've always, um, you know, fought for their liberation. Um, beginning, like I said, in high school, um, when I was actually, I was 16, I was a 10th grader, so 52 years ago. And, um, you know, we were at this predominantly white high school and, um, you know, 30 miles east of Los Angeles. And, um, you know, we just fought for uh, a black student union. They wouldn't even let us call it black student union. So we called it a mandala, which in um, a, um, South African dialect means love and power. <laughs> and, yes, and these white people, yes. they didn't know that that's what we, Amandala, you know, um, <laughs> but that's what we called it. And then a few years after we graduated, they finally let the black kids call it Black Student Union. And for a person like you, Trina, who's in Philadelphia, where it's mm -hmm. like all the schools are black, see, California is nothing like that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, currently California, black children are only 6% of the population. Um, Latino children, uh, are 60% of the population, mm -hmm. right? And when I started teaching, it was nothing. The demographics were nothing like that in the state of California. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was a predominantly, you know, very white state. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I just happened, my mother, my parents, mother and father, had the presence of mind to move us out of, you know, quote unquote, what they call the inner city, the red line district, <laughs> uh, and move us to the suburbs. And we grew up with a lot of privilege, not wealth, but privilege, right? Many, many opportunities that as we look back on it as a family, most black people didn't have in the 1960s. I mean, we took camping trips every summer. You know, we had a Coleman stove, a Coleman lantern, a Coleman ice chest, a Coleman, you know, a, a tent. A, you know, my mother made the best pancakes on the Coleman stove in the wilderness, right? We went to Yosemite. We went to Kings Canyon. We went to Sequoia. We went to New York twice in a car, in a car looking like the Beverly Hillbillies, you know? <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. Beverly that's a little... You know, you're a little too young for that. Uh, I remember um, Mama Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> but the Beverly Hillbillies was a very fun, that was a popular show back in the day when we were young. But anyway, so, um, yeah, back to this, this notion of I don't look like the type of person who would have a brother mm -hmm. who was murdered. And yet it's that school to prison pipeline that did it. Yes, but that's why your story is so important because I think that we already know how the media plays a part in portraying um, young black people, especially young black men. Um, but they also have a part in portraying who are victims of crime and what families um, can become victims of crime. And it's always painted as like these, these poor black people um, whose parents are ill-equipped to, to raise children. Um, and we already know, like, the, the narrative that was built about welfare queens um, with good black people. We know the majority of welfare recipients are white people. So, you know, all of this right. thing and how that portrays and, and feeds um, into the media. So I can see people looking at you saying, you had a brother that was murdered or you had a brother that was into, um, you know, those kind of choices and, and activities. Right. I can see that um, being a thing. 
but also people not placing the level of responsibility on schools. Yes. When I'm saying on schools, I think because when you start to talk about schools, people think it's an attack on teachers. When it's not necessarily an attack on teachers, but it is an attack and a critique on a system in which teachers are existing under. Mm -hmm. And what you have already pointed out in this very Eurocentric world um, that was created that allowed teachers to teach your, to treat your brother the way that they did, mm -hmm. that allowed teachers to talk to you um, and talk, well, talk to your brother the way they did, that allowed a teacher to call your brother the N word. And then his response and reaction then got him expelled from a school where he was met with violence, not right. physical violence, but verbal violence. So right. verbal violence. And then he responded physically. But the response to that is then to expel him, the child, yes. even in the situation. So even the power dynamics um, that exists there and that we struggle through as black people um, in these school systems that are Eurocentrically designed. So your, in my book, I cool. elevated more. Like I said, it wasn't until Trayvon Martin was murdered that I even talked about, you know, my brother's my brother's death because it was just too painful. My brother mm -hmm. and I were super, super close. We were the same age. He was a premature baby. So we were the same age for 24 days. Um, he oh. was born on July 1st. I was born on July 25th. And they used to call us twins when we were little. And I used to hate to have a boy twin, you know, um, but we <laughs> adored that yeah we just he was our heartbeat um and so yeah he's he's not um my family was was different definitely not my mother was the opposite of all of that negative narrative and my mm -hmm. father you know um and um my mother yeah so my first the first chapter in my book thoughts held hostage a black teacher's journey of unlocking young minds is called mama i start with mama because everything I am today is because of my mother, not because of white teachers, but because of my mother. My she mother, was your first teacher. My mother was my first teacher and my last teacher. <laughs> and mm -hmm. she was with us, you know, until she transitioned at 81, 14, almost 14 years ago. But I'm telling you, I am my mother's child. And she poured into me in ways that fortified my self image, fortified my agency fortified my belief in my own brilliance and my own ability to do whatever I chose to do in life. My mother fortified that. And um, she was so proud of me <clears throat> when I graduated from Pitzer, um, which is part of the Claremont Colleges, because my mother had been a cook at one of the Claremont Colleges. She'd been a cook there. And now here's her daughter graduating Great. from right and then my mother made she 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 um you know uh was very very bright and 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 eventually became a correctional officer in a women's prison but she started off as a cook but she was so smart that it didn't take her long to realize her own genius and mm -hmm. we were so proud of my mother when she aced that civil service exam and became a correctional officer now ironically you know, I am anti-mass incarceration, right? But yeah. back then, <clears throat> we didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, we didn't realize, I mean, I didn't know anything about mass incarceration because again, mm -hmm. I lived in a, not a leafy suburb, but certainly a suburb, right? Where we all, we always owned our own home. We always had a backyard with swings and a front yard with, you know, grass. And <laughs> I mean, mm. we just lived a little, Leave it to be for life almost, you know. Yeah, um, Harriet and mm -hmm. Ozzy and Harriet life almost, almost you know. Um, but again, always in, you know, the sense of um, our understanding our entitlement and yes. understanding the privilege that my mother was always clear about the privileges that we had mm -hmm. and how it was our responsibility to give back. And, and that's what we did. Mm hmm again all of my this siblings is... are like me even though they didn't i'm the only one who became a teacher all of my siblings are are giving loving thoughtful people um who my mother poured into uh, and taught us you know um how to value humanity mm -hmm. again that's because your first teacher your mom laid that that foundation for that to happen but again, I think your story is beautiful um, in so many ways, and it sheds so many lights, again, on a different, it sheds a different light on the dynamics of what folks have to go through with being Black in America. Because again, a lot of times the story that always gets shared is like the poor Black families, right, without resources, uh, who, who have to struggle with um, violence or poor choices, or people not loving them, or people not believing in them. 
So again, for your story to be, yep, I thrived, but my brother didn't. But here are the differences that we encountered. Super, super important story for folks to tell and hear because there are other people out there who I think can relate and connect to that story in ways that when we continue to share these narratives of the poor black tragedy, that some people can't can't connect because that isn't their story. So I so, so appreciate that. But Mama Dara, you lead um, an organization called the Black Education Network. Can you tell us a little bit about your organization um, and what you guys do? Well, you know, I've got to start at um, in 2001 when I created um, the, the, the California. So I was president of the Silicon Valley chapter, uh, NATSE chapter, National Alliance of Black School Educators chapter, Santa Clara County Alliance of Black Educators from 94 to 2001. And we did a lot of very impactful work with the Alliance in Silicon Valley for black children. In fact, that organization continues to thrive to this day. Um, and uh, 37 years later, um, and um, people would say, you know, what black children are doing much worse than in Silicon Valley in California. Why don't you start a statewide organization? And I was like, mm, it's difficult working with our people on a <laughs> on a regional level. I don't know about working with them that statewide, but I did. But thankfully, I had amazing founder co-founders, right? People, my founding board was amazing. Uh, James Taylor was president of the San Francisco Alliance of Black School Educators at the time. Uh, he became our vice president. Uh, my secretary was Princetta Perkins, who was one of the presidents of the Elk Grove Alliance in the Sacramento area. Um, my treasurer was Dr. Bill Ellerby, who was on the national board of NAPSE, um, the National Alliance of Black School Educators. Um, my regional coordinators, uh, Dr. Cliff Thompson out of Oakland Alliance, was the regional coordinator for the Bay Area. Dr. Ross Bassard was the regional coordinator for the Valley Bakersfield area. I speak their names because I did not build this work alone in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. I had conscious black educators. The operative word here is conscious, not Negroes. Mm -hmm. I had conscious <laughs> black educators who were just as committed to black children as I, were, as I was. We had no NAPSI um, affiliate in Los Angeles that became a part of us. So I tapped and Dr. Anne Ifekwanugwi, who I met through NBCTE, the National Board Certification Program that I ran for NAPSI in the Silicon Valley and ran one at UCLA. Um, and I tapped Anne to become the regional coordinator for Los Angeles. And then in San Diego, we had no NAPSI presence. So we found a colleague there, uh, Linwood, and Linwood became um, the regional coordinator for um for uh, the San Diego area. So I needed to give that foundational background um, because we would not be thriving as a bin 20 years later had it not been for the foundational work of the people whose names I just spoke. And they're all alive too. And I'm going to make sure they all get this podcast. Uh, James Taylor heard <laughs> the other one yesterday <laughs> because they should be honored. They should be celebrated too. Definitely. You know, I mean, I'm the one who's always in the front, always getting the awards and the accolades for the work that I do because I'm the face of the work. But there are people <clears throat> behind me um, mm -hmm. who's, Shoulders, you know, we don't talk about standing on their shoulders. They're like, shoulders you know, walk the with us, right? Walk yes. with us. Um, yes. You know, have the ancestors right there with us. So the ancestors, these are people, they're alive, so they're not even ancestors yet. Um, <clears throat> and when I had our 15th anniversary gala um, seven years ago, um, I honored all my founding board members as well as 15 other, 14 other entities that helped make us great. 15 for 15 mm -hmm. is what it was called. So I am not in a vacuum here. I am who I am today. A bin is what it is today because of these people. Let me just say fast forward that, uh, well, let me just say that. So 20 years in 1998, I started talking about um, starting that STEM program. Uh, Intel picked it up. And so it became the Intel Dr. George Washington Carver Scholars Program. Amazing, amazing what Intel did. Poured into black children for three years. At the end of three years, Intel wanted to take us national. But the three, the other two men, bless their, 
Halim Mustafa, rest in peace and power, and Rashid Salam um, were concerned that perhaps, you know, the white people would hijack Take our the program. intellectual property and cut us very out. Real, very real fear. Yes. Right? Right? Very That's a real fear, fear. right, Shana? Yes. So I'm is. like, mm. so I had to leave because the CAAAE was growing. I was starting the CAAAE at that time, not 2001. Um, you know, um, I was still teaching uh, in the at the high school level. Um, and um, I was a school district phase, the corporate phase. And I wrote all the grants for the Intel Carver Scholars Program. So I just couldn't do it any longer. So I left. It died in a month, and half those parents came to me and said, "Miss Deb, they call me Miss Deborah in California. Miss Deborah, Miss Deborah, you have got to start another STEM program." So I went to Dr. Frank Green, who is a black scientist pioneer uh, in Silicon Valley. My daughter, who's now forty-five, used to babysit for his grandkids back in the day, and I asked Dr. Green if I could name a STEM program after him. Mm-hmm. Shana, that was twenty years ago. That program has been thriving. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary. 100% of our children go to college. 90% graduate in four years with their BA or BS degrees. And 60% of those degrees are in STEM, which is Mm. eight times the national average for Black students. This is a model STEM program unapologetically focused on Black children. Now, any children can benefit from the model but ours is culturally relevant to black mm. children. And we have 170 children in that program right now. And again, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary and we did 20 for 20, 20 people who helped make that Green Scholars Program great. You are a true example of what it looks like to like find black people, work with black people, conscious and competent black people and just make it happen right because if i'm if i'm somebody i am listening to the podcast but i know folks, folks listening around like how you did all that girl did you sleep <laughs> did you have a life like what is what is happening but you're also pointing out to us like you didn't have to carry that strap or that load on your back alone there were people willing to partner with you yes. um, who were willing to do the work but again conscious and competent um on black folks who were able to do that and again shining the light and the spirit on they're out there um and there's so many of us um who want to do the work and you don't have to walk alone but great work um for the last uh, well you know you know shana it's very it's always been very important for me i'm very collaborative right i mean you know um one of my professional coaches said that i decolonized not the nonprofit industrial complex Yes. Um, because when I started my STEM, when I started CAAAE 20 years ago and Green Scholars at the same time, um, I decided that I was going to train the parents on how to run the program so that if the mm-hmm. white funders decided that we were not the flavor of the month, we could still run a program for their children. They'd still have a program for their children. And mm-hmm. so my parents have been trained on how to run that STEM program. That's the model. And when I, when I tried to replicate it, in a very, very underserved community, 95% free and reduced lunch school, uh, named after Dr. George Washington Carver, ironically. Do you know that those parents wanted the same thing that my Silicon Valley wanted? Of course they did. They wanted the same excellence for their children in, in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood of San Francisco that my parents wanted. And do you know they stepped up in similar manner with the parent engagement piece? They stepped up. You know, if you build it, they will come, they will right? Come. And if you, sure. if, if you set the bar high, Black will parents will all, they will always rise to it. Black parents will, will black always parents rise. And Black children. And, and black oh, children, of course, mama. Black children will always rise. Dr. Aza Hilliard told us that, you know, Black That's children right. are geniuses. But I'm telling you, people, they, they denigrate Black parents. You know, they yes. denigrate them. And say Very that, much. you know, the welfare queen mentality, they denigrate Black parents. And in the Carver model, most of the parents were single parents. It didn't matter. They were still showing up for their children in ways that suburban moms show up for their children, right? Who don't even have to work. So, well, again, um, giving 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 them the opportunity, the space, and the platform, and treating them like a partner. And I think that's important for us to take away from that. 
um, because what you gave was opportunity, what you gave was space, um, and what you gave was support. And a lot of times we move into spaces with black people, especially black parents, feeling like we are the holders and the key of information and all these things. Um, and don't see them as partners in the work. That's our current school model, right? Mm-hmm. You send your kid to us, um, and we'll tell you what to do with them. Um, we know better about your own child that you gave birth to and been raising <laughs> for all these years, listen, right? Listen, listen. You know what? We in, in my in my in my Green Scholars program, we start with third mm-hmm. as young as third grade, and we stay with them until they graduate from high school. That's the model, okay. right? We okay. don't take them older than eighth grade. Um, and so you were asking about the work we do. So we spun off the Green Scholars Program seven years ago when I decided to go national. I said, okay, I can no longer run this program and go national. And I gave the Green Scholars Program to Dr. Aya Deli Thomas, who is the first black woman to earn her PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. That's who I gave the program to. So when you talk about me surrounding myself with brilliant, competent black people, that's how I roll, Shana. That's Mm -hmm. how I roll, you know. And so uh, and before before um, I gave the program over literally over to Dr. Ayadeli Thomas to as her own 501c3. And I have a permanent seat on the board as the founder, Gloria Whitaker Daniels. All three of her children were in my Green Scholars program. I ran it the first seven years, and then because CAAAE exploded statewide, I had to hire Gloria to take over Green Scholars as the project manager. And Gloria doubled. I had 75 kids maximum in Green Scholars. Gloria doubled the number of kids because she had taken a golden handshake from Apple as a brilliant mechanical engineer, she was the architect of the e-reader that became the Kindle. Gloria Whitaker Daniels, all three of her children had come through my program. And I knew mm. that she could do it better than I did. And she did. Took it to a mm. whole nother level because she had the time to devote to the model. I tell you, you surround yourself with brilliant black people. They come through for you every single time. Yes. And all in the spirit of education for liberation, yeah. all in that spirit. Can you talk to us a little bit about what education for liberation means to you? And, and why I, is that I'm happy slogan? to do that. You know, it's our it's the Ben's tagline. So our yes, tagline, why is that a tagline of right? Our tagline is education for liberation. And so, as you know, because I've been an, I've been an educator for 45 years, and as you know, um, there's nothing liberatory about the status quo. Right. Um, I mean, that's why the center exists. That's why I love Sharice work so much, because he's yes. like, no, no, no. We're going to have to do something very different, very radically different. We're going to have to radically put, different, radically yes. different. We're going to have to grow our own, you know, and that's something we're going to be working on as well. Um, growing our own. Um, but one of the things that um, I did, um, you know, as a as a as a way of growing our own um, is establish the Black Students of California United. So BSCU is another organization that was born out of a bin. You know, we incubated the Black Students of California United um, uh, in under a bin. So I helped raise the first half a million dollars um, for uh, the Black Students of California United. We call it BSCU for short. We had 24 24 schools in our network when we started uh, seven years ago. At the end of last school year, we had 140 schools Mm -hmm. up and down California that were now part of the BSEU. So why do I elevate that as part of the Ben's work? Because again, it's surrounding myself with other founders, you know, um, Dr. Angie Barfield, who just ended up getting her her doctorate. Um, um, uh, Jackie McFadden, veteran, amazing, brilliant, fabulous Black Student Union advisor. And Dr. Angela Williams, who's one of the smartest people I know on the planet. Um, You know, Mm. those, I called those three people together to help me create a statewide organization for Black children where they could grow up efficacious full of agency, able to fight oppression on their own terms. That's what a bin does as well. Um, the other thing I want to elevate. Nation oh, building here. Excuse me? 
This is true nation building here. That's nation, nation building, building, right. Well. The other thing I want to elevate is our summer institutes. You know, I had Sharif as one of my speakers last summer at the institute. So when I started CAAA in 2001 with those people I mentioned already, um, I went to, I, I knew as a veteran educator, it's the, it's the teacher stupid, that if you don't change <laughs> the teacher's practice, you will never close gaps. If you don't yes. change the teacher practice, you will never change tap gaps. Let me say that one more time. If you don't change, don't change the teacher practice, the teacher you will practice. never change never gaps. Yes. And so right. I decided to create a summer institute, not a conference, an institute called Pedagogies and Practices for Successfully Reaching African-American Children. And for the next decade, I only brought in black scholars. The first year, Dr. Bob Moses of the Algebra Project. Second yes. year, Dudley Daniel Tatum. Why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? The third year, Gloria Latson Billings, Dream Keepers. The fourth year, Pedro Nogueira. The fifth year, Wade Nobles, one of the founders of the Association of Black Psychologists. The sixth year, Lisa Delpit, Other People's Children. The seventh year, I brought in Shiraki Holly so that Shiraki can show people what the pedagogy looked like when it was applied. At that time, Shiraki ran the highest performing charter school for black children in LA Unified School District and had been running that school for 10 years. The Culture and Language Academy of Success class. That was Shiraki School, seventh year. Eighth year, I brought in Carol Lee. Carol Lee and her husband, Dr. Haku, Haki Marubuti, are the founders of Black Classic Press. Um, out of Chicago. They also run the oldest independent black school in the country. I brought Carol Lee in to talk about that model. The ninth year, I brought back Dr. Bob Moses because California was still wringing his hands on how to teach algebra to black kids. And Dr. Moses had written the book. He wrote the, uh, you know, the wow. radical equations, right? He, yes. wrote the, he wrote the blueprint for how to teach mm -hmm. any kid even the poorest kids in the Delta, which is where he yeah. tested the algebra project, brought mm -hmm. him back yeah. in the ninth year. Yeah, Ten our high school is right now, Dr. Uh, um, our high school is right now, Mama Deborah, are reading a book by Bob Moses and other group of collaborators called um, Radical Quality Equation. Education. We're reading Quality Education. The Quali okay, by Bo yeah, Dr. Moses. Tenth year, yeah. I brought in Dr. Geneva Gay. These are all doctors. I brought in. So what I do is I center black scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. And they were the keynoters, but but the other people who were part of it were just as brilliant in, in many ways, um, but they were brilliant in their own kind of ways. But so if you go to Ben's website, abenforace.org, if you go to our website, and you click on what we do, you can see the broad swath of what we do. We do a lot. Doc, um, we just rolled out the only culturally relevant STEM program, STEM curriculum, pro well, STEM program created by Black people for Black children in grades three, four, and five in the world. There is no STEM program like ours. There is no STEM curriculum like ours in the world. Nowhere mm -hmm. in the world. We've done the scan. So mm -hmm. go, to the website, go to the website of binforace.org. Click on what we do. Look at the breadth. I've only, I've only touched the surface, you know, in the interest of time of what yes. we do. But we do a lot, Shana, and people can go to the website and learn more. Yes, but a big part of what you do and a big part of um, definitely why your STEM curriculum and there's nothing in the world like it is because you guys focus a lot on African-centered education. And the reason why I want to lift that up is because I really feel like um, they're naysayers uh, when it comes to talking about African-centered education. There are Black folks um, who will use the word culturally relevant pedagogy in one sentence and then the next sentence um, just completely just ignore or have negative things to say about an African-centered um, yeah. lens or approach. So I would love for you to speak on why African-centered education is important for Black children. Not just culturally relevant, right? Like why is African-centered education important for Black children? 
Yes, and uh, thank you for asking that question. So uh, my Jagna, um, people call them mentors, but my Jagna, Dr. Joyce mm -hmm. King, um, has been with me on the journey for, tw for two decades. And she was the one who started sending me data about how horribly black children were doing outside of California and why mm -hmm. I needed to create a national organization. Fortunately, I just gotten a large grant from, uh, well, nine, 10 years ago, I'd gotten a large grant from the Kellogg Foundation as part of their racial equity work. And mm -hmm. I convened along with some other brilliant black people, um, 200 conscious black people in Chicago at the Weston O'Hare in October, 2012. And that's where the seed for a bin was planted. But there were other people there. Dr. Ivor Carruthers was focused on, um, you know, dismantling the mass incarceration system. Um, Dr. Joyce King had an idea of a Pan-African online university. Um, we had a youth focus with Fluke Fluker uh, and some of our young people on how to build an agency in our young people. So this is what happened in Chicago in 2012. It was so powerful that we had a second convening in 2013. And that's when it was clear that my idea of a thousand African-centered schools was really born. And it was, I knew then that they couldn't just be culturally relevant. They had to be African centered. And that's why if you look at a Ben's website on our homepage, we say toward the movement of African centered schools. I mean, that's in big headlines, you know, and that's probably why we don't get funded half the time from, from people yes. because yes. we're unapologetically African centered. And what that means is that we elevate Africa, the, the Africa and the greatness of our people before the Ma'afa. The Ma'afa is another mm -hmm. word for, um, for the, the, we don't, Dr. Wade Noble said, don't call it the slave trade because that sounds like say, you're dealing in coffee. With he said, don't call, it the trans, uh, don't call it the middle passage because that sounds like a hallway. He said, we need to use some African words to describe what happened to our people. And that is called the Ma'afa, M-A apostrophe A-F-A. And the Ma'afa is another word for that horrible thing or the or the Holocaust, right? So we talk about the Holocaust of what happened to African people. Remember, we had some of the first libraries in Timbuktu. We still have those those ancient scrolls. My business partner of, ten, of nine years, Tony Browder, is in Kemet right now. Tony his, Browder. Tony Browder and I have been joined at the hip for nine years doing this work together. And he's in Kemet texting me every day about you know, things going on over here because he's from Chicago. So everything about that Highland, you know, tragedy has struck, you know, really home with him because he said, but look at how many people were slaughtered in other parts of Chicago that same weekend. Now, we're not trying to in any way diminish the tragedy that happened to at those all. innocent people. We're not diminishing that tragedy at all. We're just saying, can we at once get some attention to the same bloodshed that occurred in so the mass murderings that happen every day? Yes, every day that our, our children have to dodge bullets to get to school. You know what I'm yes. saying, Shana? I mean, you know yes, what I'm saying. You I can do. finish my sentences. So <laughs> all I'm saying, look, listen, all I'm saying is that, you know, you know, our vision, my vision for a bin is that we will have a thousand African centered schools around the country um, that are producing children who um, have been taught to fight oppression on their own terms so that they mm -hmm. don't become fodder for the school to prison pipeline. I was just talking to one of the a founder this morning of the Columbus, the Col Col Columbo school, I always get it wrong, uh, in Atlanta. Fabulous. Mama Amanada just this morning and saying that, you know, Ben is adopting your school. We're, we're adopting the Sankofa Freedom School in, um, in, in Philadelphia. We're adopting. Yes, Dr. With, Mama Aisha. We've been Imani. working with the Sankofa Freedom School for 10 years. Um, yes. you know, they were at, they were part of our convening in 2012 in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, um, in, um, in, um, in, in Chicago. Um, Dr. Kelly Mickens has been with us. For yes. a decade, 
So we're, yes. and then the Barbara Sizemore School in Chicago, right? And so there are schools, there are independent black schools that have been struggling, sure. struggling to keep their doors open for mm -hmm. decades. And that needs to change. We need some wealthy black people or Mackenzie Scott. <laughs> I love <laughs> yes. I love what she does with her money. I want some wealthy black people or Mackenzie Scott um, mm -hmm. to invest in African centered schools the way she's been investing in HBCUs and even the center and, you know, Girl Trek. I'm part of Girl Trek. Um, you know, I love what she's done with her money. And I just wish we had some more black people doing that. I agree. I agree. Because the African centered schools are extremely important um, and a necessity for our children. But I wanted to bring up that question because I wanted to highlight that there is a difference when we're talking about African centered um, and culturally relevant pedagogy. And I want people to understand, you know, what that difference really is. And African centered is exactly what we're saying. We're centering Africa, meaning that our children are learning about themselves way beyond the start of slavery. And I love the intentional language use of the Maafa. We're not going to call it the Middle Passage. We're not going to call it the Transatlantic Slave Trade. We're going to call it exactly um, the horribleness of, you know, that it was, the Holocaust that it was. The and I think that, you know, folks look at that um, and they think that if I'm being culturally relevant, like I'm on par, I'm doing the right things for black kids, but not understand that it goes way beyond that and goes way deeper than that. Um, when we're talking about really impacting black children and helping them understand who they are. Um, and um, as my mentor, Dr. Carr, likes to say, who they are, right? And who they actually believe yes. in um, and, and where they come from. So dope, dope that, that Abin is doing that work. Another thing that I would love to point out, too, is um, you stress um, high quality outcomes for students. A lot of times when we focus on um, African-centered education, People can't see past just African-centered language. They can't see past African-centered clothing. They can't see past any of that. They do not talk about the high quality outcomes of the practice as you spoke in earlier with the pedagogy, changing the pedagogy would go, that goes with closing those gaps for students. So can you please talk about some of the strategies that you guys use to produce high quality outcomes with students? Thank you for that question. And you have great questions. <laughs> Thank you, Shana. Um, well, one of, you know, one of my, let me tell you what my major strategy is, right? It's mm -hmm. using black scholars. So mm -hmm. my major strategy from the, from the beginning, why should I go to other people who've never been black a day in their lives? I don't mm -hmm. care if they have a PhD in Africana studies. They've never been black a day in their lives. They know nothing about microaggressions and what it's like to be followed in a grocery store or in a closed. Mm. They, they don't know anything about what it really means to be a black person. And, I'm, you know, I've got lots of great allies, so don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, why should I center non-black scholarship when I can center black scholarship? And so mm -hmm. I just I just told you the last the first 10 people that were at our, I just told you that just the keynoters, you know, you can go yes. on our website and listen, look at, we just had our 17th Institute. We took a four year hiatus after the 10th year because people were telling me, Deborah, we're not getting traction in the field with the great practices that we're learning at your Institute because of systemic racism. So I told mm -hmm. my board, we're stopping the institutes and I'm gonna go work on statewide policy in California. Mm -hmm. And while I was working on statewide policy over the next four years, we did not hold an institute because it wasn't about making money. We were making lots of money on those. Inst we'd sell those institutes out every year. Shana, mm -hmm. every year we'd sell those institutes out on the Stanford, eight years on the Stanford campus, two years on the UCLA campus. Every year we'd sell out, um, except for the two years we were at UCLA. <laughs> and I think because UCLA is accustomed to having, you know, institutes like ours. But when we were at Stanford, we would sell out every year. And they're, mm -hmm. they're not conferences, they're institutes. institutes. Um, and Learning. that's because Learning we're narrowly exactly. focused on pedagogies and practices for successfully reaching African-American students. So every speaker every year addressed that topic. Um, mm -hmm. And so they would give us all kinds of strategies, Shana, on how to reach our children. You know, and like I said, I, I named them. You doing math? Use Bob Moses's The Algebra Project Method. For black kids, mm -hmm. um, you you know you're doing um, you know uh, 
uh, you're creating um, efficacy in black children, uh, use Beverly Daniel Tatum's work, right? Mm -hmm. um, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? You're doing, um, you know, you're working with non-black teachers. Um, use Dr. Gloria Latson Billings' book, Dream Keepers. You know, she profiled non-black teachers who were successful with black kids. So, I mean, I'm a product of that. I'm a product of all white teachers, right? But again, those same ones terrorized my brother behind me. So it's that complicity, that complacency, that willingness to toe the line that kept me, you know, thriving in that Eurocentric frame. But yes. my brother wasn't the one. He was spoiled and accustomed to getting his way. Um, so that was oppositional for them. Um, mm -hmm. So the strategies are many, Shana. And I would just, again, point to those Black scholars that are on our website at benforace.org, what we do, and Summer Institute, you get the history, and then Summer Institute 2022, what we did just last week. Listen, the, the resources are there. Y'all hear what Mama Deborah telling y'all, the resources are there. Um, and we always, Mama, because we like to use this podcast as well as a teaching tool and a resource tool for educators. So I appreciate you dropping all of this knowledge um, and all of, the, all of these gems. Um, but just because of your work and, and what, you're, what you've been doing over the past couple of years, I think it's really good to hear from someone like you who has been building and doing and, I mean, busting down barriers and leaping over so many hurdles that have been put in the way for liberation for Black people and Black children. Ultimately, right, when your life's work is done, what does equitable education look like for Black children? And how do we as a community fight together to continue to accomplish that? So, you know, I, I just did another, I tell you, I was telling you, I just did another podcast the other day and she sort of ended with a similar question. And I said, there are three things that I think, um, you know, we could do, right? Um, mm -hmm. First of all, you know, we build allies too. So my institute yeah. is very multicultural, right? And the white teachers, they love it because we don't do the shame and blame about slavery, you know, enslavement, mm -hmm. I should say. Um, we say, okay, how can you help Jamal tomorrow <laughs> or Lakeisha? And, um, you know, and they are always excited and willing and they're so energized when they leave the institute because they mm -hmm. feel efficacious. Like they have agency now to help yes. um, children in their spaces of, in their spheres of influence. So I believe mm -hmm. in, um, in, in number one, bloom where planted, right? Wherever you are working, um, use your knowledge to uh, empower the children in your space. You can't do everybody. I can't do everybody, but I can do the ones that come in my orb, right? So there, so, so bloom where planted, um, take what you learn. I tell them all the time, you know, part of the Institute, how are you going to apply? what you've learned here today. And we ask them that question. We give them time to process that and come back and share um, a few people. Uh, the other thing is we've got to move to African-centered education for those children who we can um, do that for. We, we, we have to have a thousand schools around the country that um, unapologetically focus on African-centered education at its best. And thirdly, we need programs like my STEM program on the after school level. Um, we, we need programs um, <clears throat> like that where um, they're Saturday schools, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, um, I love the Jewish model where they teach their children. I love yes. that model. They teach the Jewish people teach their children about their culture, right? Mm -hmm. The Chinese have schools like that on Saturday, you know, other okay. ethnic groups have schools like that. The program that Tony Browder and I started when he used to come out to California every year for four years to teach at three high schools that I, in programs that I ran um, in that same district where I started 37, well now 45 years ago, um, we created the cultural imperative program. Tony said, it's imperative that our children understand their culture. Right. Mm -hmm. And Queen 
Thais Nowton from Liberated Minds Institute always says, our culture is our cure. Our culture is our cure. So my third way is to create more STEM programs like mine in Silicon Valley in underperforming, quote unquote, underperforming communities, because there's no such thing as an underperforming child. There's only an underperforming system that that child is a part of. There is no such thing as an underperforming child. There are only underperforming systems that our children are a part of. And that yes. to me is an important point to make. It's an extremely important point to make because what you do is shift the responsibility off of the child, right? And put the responsibility onto the systems um, that we need to tear down so that we can have effective teaching and create spaces where our children can definitely thrive. So it's a very important point to make. Mama, before we get out of here, I want to give you the time and the space to thank a Black teacher or some Black teachers. I just want to give you the, the opening to do that. So, you know, um, Dr. Coastal Lassane is a, a Ben's board chair. Brilliant. My Coastal girl. Lassane is um, a, I'm just so blessed to have her as my board chair. Ironically, let me, I have to tell this very short story. So we did a regional, uh -huh. we did a regional conference in um, Philadelphia, right? For a bin a few years ago. And she met me there and she said to me, you're going to be my Jegna. And I was like, girl, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> But she was like, you're going to be my Jagna. And so she, true to form, followed through. And um, I am her Jagna now. And But she's so much to us um, as an organization. Uh, and she stepped up at a critical juncture in our, our organization's history to become the board chair. And she was only supposed to be interim. And she's like, Mom, Deborah, you still have me as... I said, I know, just take the interim off now. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Akosua, um, I, I elevate her right now um, as a Black educator because she created Sisters in Education Circle. And Sisters in Education Circle is a healing space. Um, and you know, Dr. Koswa Lassane has a summer conference coming up, um, yes, a summer retreat coming up. So I'm doing a shout out about her summer retreat coming up. And if people can get themselves there, to um to Charleston, South Carolina, South Carolina it will be yeah. transformative for them. If you live in the South and you're within the sound of my voice, please go to Sisters in Education Circle, SEEK for short, S-I-E-C. Um, look at her on Facebook, Instagram, um, and 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 really I'm giving her a shout out because her work is so incredibly powerful and it's impactful. Um, for all of those um, other Black educators who are females, um, who are in the, the beast. It's a machine. It's a beast. And, you know, we rage against the beast, but there's only so much we can do because the beast is what it is, what it is and the beast is going nowhere. And so what we have to do instead is we have to be like the ants in the African proverb, and we have to... Um, we have to consume the elephant one ant at a time. So we got a billion ants and the ants ate the elephant. <laughs> yes. The elephant yes. here is systemic racism and a system that was never designed for the success of our children ever, ever. And so when people go through all kinds of contortions, making it look like it was designed or trying to make it work, it was not made to work. It's working like it was made to, right? It's so Carter G. Woodson Producing called it out. Exactly what it's supposed to. He yes, Carter he G. Woodson called it out in the 30s in the miseducation of the Negro. And I want to give a shout out, one more shout out to another black educators, Dr. Jarvis Givens. His book is hey. called Fugitive Pedagogy. Um, yes. Carter G. Woodson and the Art of Black Teaching. I just had Dr. Givens as my keynote speaker for this year's institute, right? Along with Dr. Geneva Gay, I brought her back. Um, and, uh, Dr. and Glenn Singleton uh, from, you know, Courageous Conversations. I'm telling you, that institute was off the freaking chain. And people say, Debra, you're in <laughs> every year it's better than the last year. But it's like, I know, I, and I get all the speakers, you know, I organize it all. But I'm telling you, I go after the best and the brightest. That's what I do. And we appreciate you for it, Mama. 
Listen, we want to thank you for giving us your time today. Again, with all of the work you're doing and all the impact that you have in education. Um, and we just appreciate you continuing to do this liberation work and lead the way and be an example to all of us. Um, for sure for me, because I'm like, ooh, child, I thought I was doing something. I got this. <laughs> You are doing something, Shayna. I got are. to, I got to get out here, Mama. Do a little more, okay? You are, you are doing the example. Something. You are the light. I'm doing a little something, but <laughs> baby, it is time for me to stand on the shoulders of giants like you to be able to be ready to carry on the torch and you know continue this work. But we do, we we truly thank you for for all of the work you're doing and everything you're putting in. We thank you and we love you, Mama, and we appreciate you. I love y'all too. I love the center. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love your work. I love Sharif. <laughs> yes, but well, we want to thank you for your time here today, and we want to thank everybody for joining us for building the Black Educated Pipeline podcast um, and watching and joining us today. So please make sure if you like this episode, make sure that you're leaving a review. Um, you're giving us our stars, five stars to really appreciate the work that Mama Deborah is doing out here. But we will see you next time. Same place, Apple, Spotify, wherever you like to subscribe on major podcasts, subscribe to Building the Black Educated Pipeline. See you next time, everybody. Peace.